Hello, everybody. Happy New Year to you. And um, here is our discussion agenda. And as um, some of you know, we did one discussion, I think, last year uh, around library literacy. And the whole idea here is to um, interact. And so, the, uh, so what I want you all to do first is put introductions. And we'll do that in a second. We've got people who are in our room at this point. So go ahead and put into chat your name, the name of your library. And actually, why don't you put the name of the town? Because um, lots of folks, you know, you may be a county system and they might not know the, the town that you're in. Your title and role in literacy. Uh, so go ahead and do that and put that into chat. Now, do they need to know how to raise hands and all that kind of stuff? Um, I did mute one participant for background noise, which is um, Susan, but everybody else does not need to raise their hand. If they want to talk, if they want to talk, you know, sequence-wise. Sure, we can do that. Um, if you want to raise your hand, that is... Right. The hand raise button is on the, um, the side of the box there. So everybody, while we're, we're working our, this out, want to make sure you do your uh, introductions. I'm Sandy Newell. I'm Sandy Newell, and I am the uh, literacy consultant with the Bureau of Library Development here at the Division of Library and Information Services, which is our official name for actually the state library. And I uh, want to welcome everybody and your interest today, and in, in particularly adult literacy uh, is more of our topics. And where it crosses over, I know there's like intergenerational literacy, it crosses over. So we don't have really a formal agenda. I did think that we would start off with uh, any of those who have been doing career online high school, particularly the status of graduates. We haven't had a phone call related to that. It, the funding was not funded for another um, uh, year, but we do know that um, that all of you out there that have gotten um, slots, scholarship slots for folks, that folks have like a year and a half, I believe, to get their high school diploma. So I thought we'd, we'd start off with that. Um, I'm real curious, a few of you are new to library literacy, and I'd like to know what do staff new, new to so, library literacy, need yeah, to know. Yeah. Um, then we'll, and again, this is this is an informal agenda. So any trends in literacy, I ran into this whole. And there's an article, a recent article on multi-literacy. There's a really good article that's out there on mainstreaming the collection. And uh, curious on whether any of you are using the new literacy apps that are out there. So uh, as you just saw, you can raise your hand, and we would like you to talk. And uh, the other thing, too, is we do have a uh, program, the Florida Literacy Coalition is putting on February 10th. We'll be sending out a link to that. And then, of course, there's the Florida Literacy Conference, which is uh, the end of May. So, and then scroll it up some. We've got potential topics. And we'll go back to the top. Oh, not down a little bit. Right there. I've got potential topics. I just drop these in to help you think about what questions that you might have. You know, English language learners, I know a lot of you are doing some small group things or one-to-one -one tutoring, uh, working with prison uh, inmates, volunteer literacy is certainly big, workforce is big, uh, book discussions, health literacy, sustainability, intergenerational literacy partnerships. I just drop these in as potential topics, not, not things that you need to. So, Let's scroll back on back up to the top of our agenda here. And I want to look over. Did everybody get themselves um, introduced in chat? And as you speak up, uh, say your first name. Often folks will hear somebody say, oh, I'm doing this. And they might want to contact you directly. And so it's nice to know who is, who is doing things. So did it. I'm guessing everybody got their got introduced into chat and figured that out. So uh, let's do a, sort of an easy one. 
those of you who uh, uh, have been doing career on on high school, why don't you raise your hand, and and then I'll have you um, uh, report out the number of graduates or anything you'd like to, to share with that. Uh, the other thing to know is the Florida Literacy, the Florida Library Association does have the funding for career on high school in their platform. And FLA has their library day on, on January 22nd there. So if folks would, if, if you have been doing career online high school, let's just start off with that. Uh, raise your hand. First person to raise their hand for career online high school was uh, Matthew David. Matthew, you're unmuted, so you can go ahead and talk if you'd like. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, so yeah, we um, we are on track to have our next graduation ceremony in May, um, and uh, we 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 have about 29 uh, students currently enrolled, and I think a handful of students who have graduated. So we typically see anywhere from 10 to 15 uh, graduates at our ceremonies, which we do every year. And of course, fingers crossed that it'll get funded next year. Um, but no, uh, no real issues with the process right now. Uh, of course, the, the people who are in it really love it, and we love it, and so we want we want more of it. But uh, that's all I have for COHS right now. Okay, Eric Hughes uh, is next. Eric, you're unmuted. Or here, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, so you can go ahead and talk. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, we had about um, 18 people graduate so far from the program. Uh, we had a graduation ceremony back in October, and uh, we have probably about as many who are looking like they might be ready by May or so. We'll have another graduation, so we're keeping an eye on those guys. But <clears throat> I think we had a pretty successful program. We're sorry it didn't come back this year, but we we're hoping it will definitely come back. And Eric, uh, tell us, uh, where are you? Tampa. Tampa, okay. Oh, we actually have a question. Um, for brand new people like me, could someone explain what COHS is, please? Thanks. <laughs> Good question, the alphabet soup. <laughs> is some, one of you, uh, uh, David or uh, Eric, you wanna say what it is? Career Online High School. <laughs> And, and the way it works works is Gail, some of you will know Gail because they do our electronic resources at the statewide level. They actually are a company that, uh, that you pay for uh, scholarships for Career Online High School. And uh, last year, the funding, it was funded. The funding ended as of uh, July, June. Um, so we're hoping on maybe funding again, but that's, that's what COHS stands for. Good, very good question. Any other questions about that program? Okay, uh, Susan also raised her hand. Susan, you can go ahead and talk. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so the Career Online High School is an amazing program. Uh, we did have a graduation last November with about a dozen people in attendance. What our participants really love is the fact that they get that career certificate in addition to that actual high school diploma. Um, we've had students tell us that they literally took that career certificate in retail and were able to get hired pretty much on the spot after showing that certificate. Wonderful story. And these are the stories that um, the uh, legislators need to hear about the impact of this program. We have one comment. Uh, that is great. So spreading, spreading the word about the value of the program, anything that you can do, as I say, Library Day is, is uh, 22nd of January. Also, County Commission Library, not a Library Day, the County Association has their legislative day. I think it's the 29th. So there's lots of different ways you can connect with um, with the legislatures about the value of the program. One of the other things that I have that that I think is particularly good, in addition to the certificates and people getting their high school diploma, is the fact that uh, some of these folks 
are not good test takers and they just never were able to you know, pass the GED test or pass the tests that are required whenever you're, you're going through um, high school. And this is really filled in the hole for, for that. You can go ahead, Greg. Uh, hi, Greg Smith. Just a quick question. Um, is there data available as to how many uh, graduates um, completed the program thus far or in the last year? There actually is. I didn't pull it down. I know Amy has has shared it. Maybe it's, it might be a couple weeks old. Um, but yeah, we, we are keeping up with that data. So Greg, just make sure, remind me to, you know, to get it to you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, my next thing on the agenda was orientation for new library literacy staff. We've been seeing there's uh, lots of new folks who actually have come on board. And in fact, we might have, I think, um, some folks who are relatively new are in on this call. If so, uh, if you're relatively new, a year, year and a half or under, you want to raise your hand? Um, Emily Morgan, go ahead. Emily? Oh, uh, and Sheila also contributed. She says, I don't have a mic today, sorry, but I am brand new. Um, okay. Daniela? You can go ahead and talk. Melissa? I have everybody unmuted, so. <clears throat> Melissa says, I started in September. Happy to join you all as the literacy assistant for Hillsboro Literacy. Melissa doesn't have a mic. Patricia? says I just took over last pat this past September um, Daniela says I have been the adult literacy specialist for Sarasota County for the past year now so one of the things um, that I think for those of you who are particularly new is you know what kind of orientation uh, how can we help you as you settle into your your new job uh, I know the uh, Florida Literacy Coalition has a lot of uh, services. You want to say a little bit, Greg, what what y'all provide, what you provide for folks who are newer? Sure, happy to do that. Um, so we um, we're the Adult and, and Family Literacy Resource Center here in Florida, and in that capacity, offer trainings throughout the year, both um, in person as well as online training courses, um, and uh, we have a, a leadership institute that may be of interest to some folks who are who are on the line. Uh, it'll be coming up um, in early March. We haven't made the official announcement, but be on the lookout for that. Hopefully everybody here is on our um, email list. If not, just um, uh, let us know. Shoot me an email. We'd be happy to include you on that list. And the Leadership Institute is specifically for community-based um, providers uh, in, in sort of the nonprofit, primarily in the nonprofit and library-based programs. And uh, talking about issues of common interest and uh, fundraising, student recruitment, um, and assessment, things of that nature. Uh, that's a two days symposium. Most of our most of our workshops are much short, shorter than that. Um, you may have been to some of our recent regional symposiums, um, things of that nature. And in our big training event for the year, as um, Sandy mentioned earlier, is the Florida Literacy Conference. So that's uh, April 29th through May 1st. It's going to be here in the Orlando area this year in Lake Mary. Um, and information is on our website. We're about to 
uh, probably um, tomorrow or Monday, we will be putting up a, an expanded version of our conference webpage, which has more information. Um, but um, there's probably sufficient information to take a look at the event up there even today um, around um, you know, what the event is and registration costs and hotel accommodations and things of that nature. But uh, keep an eye out for more information that will be forthcoming at the, at the beginning of next week. And we bring together, it's usually around 450 people from around the state. It's a pretty traditional conference. And we will be having a library literacy track as we traditionally do. And I know that um, um, Sandy is already working on some sessions for that. And um, so we're, we're, we are open to and we certainly would welcome any of you if you're interested in doing a session. Our call for presenters is coming up tomorrow, the deadline. So if you're interested in that, please go ahead and make a submission. Um, and we also have some awards that we present annually, the Florida Literacy Awards. And so if you're interested in making a nomination for an outstanding individual organization you feel is worthy of recognition, um, uh, that information is on our website too, and we'd, we'd love to have your nominations. So. And um, uh, Susan's doing the uh, Train the Trainer. Uh, is that right, the part? Train the Trainer. Yeah, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm sorry. That, that's, and Susan, maybe you can speak to that yeah. um, a little bit more as well, but it's a, an opportunity to, to train new tutor trainers, and we do this every other year. Um, it is uh, aligned with the pro-literacy certification process, and Susan is, is the trainer for that. So um, anything you'd like to add, Susan? And um, how long is the training trainer? So uh, it's, yeah, I mean, it, this is a multi-part training. The first session will be uh, as a, a pre-conference session at the, at the Florida Literacy Conference, and that's uh, pretty close to a full-day training. Then there's um, an online sort of webinar-based component, um, and then the group's coming together for a final session. So it's, it's, it's pretty intensive. Yes. Yeah. One of the um, key takeaways that participants have uh, remarked about in the past is you pretty much leave with some training content, but you also leave with the platform skills. Uh, if you're not comfortable in instructing, if you're not comfortable in different classroom management techniques, if you're not comfortable um, you know, giving, and, giving and getting feedback in how you are as a presenter, this course will help you grow so much. Yeah. It's excellent, and, and Susan does a great job with it. And the good news is it's free. Uh, the training's free. There's a $25 fee to cover the lunches for the two days, but um, thanks to our grant support, we're able to make it available free of charge other than that. So please take advantage of that if you're interested in training some new volunteers or staff folks on you know, um, really good, effective strategies to do tutor training. And I'll throw in, you know, a best practice is to have several people be tutor trainers. You know, so you right. can be a project manager. I do know some systems out there that it ends up being like the only person who does the tutor training is like, I'll say, the executive director or somebody in that role. And the more that you can spread it out, the better. Obviously, it needs to be somebody who has been um, tutoring and has some experience. But there are folks who have, you know, get comfortable. They've been tutoring for a while that would be glad to join you as staff people to be a, a tutor trainer. And that also makes the, the workshop itself more interesting is when you have a variety of voices um, doing the training. Absolutely. Sandy, right. Having a team, so team approach. Yeah, Sandy, you were so correct with saying that. You know, a good practice would be to send two or three individuals <laughs> literacy organization to attend the train the tutor trainer just way you can collaborate you can um, you know improve one another I, I can't tell you I mean when we started the literacy program for Citrus County which is going to be 11 12 years we had five trainers well over the years only one left and I've had to always work with new staff coming in so you it really does help sustainability if if you have more than one trainer we have some uh, comments in the chat. Patricia says, Florida Humanities is launching a new family literacy program in partnership 
with Orange County Library System, and we are looking for additional library partners statewide. Um, Sheila has a question. Can we get a list of contacts for getting signed up on email lists? Oh, I'm just in the... We're going to have a literacy listserv at some point, but we don't have it yet. Mm -hmm. um, Greg, I guess as far there, as far as what are some of the the listservs? What's what's out there? Uh, when when well, the question being on the email list um, versus a, is a discussion list. So I can speak to both. I mean, we do have a discussion list and we also are pretty active here at FLC with social media uh, in terms of sort of communication among among um, providers um, if you are interested in getting on our list and I mean I'm, I can't speak to other folks list but um, we, you, know, you can get that information through our website or just shoot me an email I'll, I can give you my email it's Smith G S M I T H G at floridaliteracy.org and I don't know can I put that into the thing here well, would everyone see that if, if I put that into the chat box or, yes, or is that not being shared yeah go ahead and do that okay and then we'll just get you signed up just to let us know your name and the organization or library that you're represented and we'll make sure they get you on the list to get updates on um, all of our training events and uh, we actually have a few grant opportunities as well here and as well as other information we share throughout the year. Okay, so we have another question from the chat um, from Emily that says, what are some additional resources other than new reader press to purchase literacy materials? And then some answers from the chat are, um, a great online training course that helped me this year was the Literacy Through Libraries course through Pro Literacy. I highly suggest anybody new take this also, Grassroots Publishing, also Elizabeth Clare's Easy English News, um, as well as Oxford is great for English language learners. Anybody have any other suggestions? So there are there is more out there, not as much as not as much as we would like, but but there is more out there. Um, and one of the um, trends is um, the whole concept of mainstreaming the collection. I know whenever I was out running a literacy program, we actually called it ABE, and we had it totally separate, hidden back in the corner of the building. <laughs> Um, we did check out workbooks at the time, and this was in the olden days when <laughs> there was not much as far as electronic. But now the whole thing is really mainstreaming the collection, and there's a really good article that it was in um, Tennessee, and I can't remember it was Nashville. And uh, one of their most popular um, I, books is I Am Malaya. And um, so pulling things in that are in your collection, but that are adult oriented. Obviously, you don't want to pull in items that are look too childish, but and then marketing it and, and blending it in. And um, I really thought that was a, a really cool and, you know, and calling them quick reads. You know, a lot of people quick reading is in now. And uh, so just marketing to everyone, but also, you know, making sure you, you sort of have some t uh, titles that are accessible to those who um, struggle with regular reading. Emily says, we just reclassified ours to ABE and moved it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's a, yeah, adult basic education. Again, that's what we, that's basically what we used um, because that's the uh, ABE is for the uh, folks who are eighth grade and under, I believe <clears throat> that that's still the case uh, for, um, the adult ed um, classes that are that are out there. So there are some there are some different ways to to really mainstream and to market it, and to do a broader marketing so it's less of a stigma to it. That seemed to be the the context of this article that I read. Uh, I can just mention some materials that we have freely available in hard copy and with a lot of stuff on our website. But um, if you're interested in, in incorporating health education, health literacy into 
your adult education, ESL instruction. We do have a curriculum series and to Florida providers we're able to provide hard copies, not in unlimited numbers, um, but um, can give you a classroom set of those materials. And we do have um, a grant out right now. Hopefully you've heard about it, but if you haven't, um, the deadline is coming up um, at the end of this month. Uh, this is sponsored through Florida Blue and it's um, grants of up to $5,000 to incorporate um, health education, health literacy, you know, really basic stuff for the most part in, in many cases, um, you know, understanding, um, you know, how to read prescription medicine bottles, you know, interacting with uh, your doctors, also understanding a little bit about the American healthcare system, which is not simple stuff <laughs> at all. Uh, but uh, go to our website if you're interested in that. We're, we certainly would, would welcome your application. It's a fairly, um, I mean, it's not one page or it's up to five pages, but a fairly brief application if you're, you're interested in incorporating that kind of contextualized learning into your program. And, and you do have the um, essay book that you publish. Oh, right. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, right now we have a call for essays for adult learners uh, and to contribute essays to um, uh, an annual publication we've been doing for uh, over a decade now. And um, it's rolled out at the Florida Literacy Conference and um, students, uh, we have some students come and read their essays during the conference, which is great. It's one, one of the highlights of the whole of the whole conference and um, every student in the programs get a copy. It's a hard copy book um, of the essay, uh, of the, excuse me, get a copy of the uh, essay book. So um, again, that's on our website too and that's an open call that we have right now and it really is we've had a lot of students participate over the years and a lot of times it's the first time that they've had their work in print and um, it's um, you know it can be very well it's, it's very special for us and it can be very special for for adult learners too and sometimes local programs have um, rec had separate events to recognize their authors and so forth so it's it's a cool cool um, opportunity if you have any students or interested in, in writing at all. Okay. We have a comment from Susan. Um, the essay book from FLC is great. It is very touching to hear the personal stories. We have had six learners get published over the years. Tutors get credit too. And then we have a question from Daniela. What are some ways your library systems market resources to adult learners? I'll see if people chiming in. <clears throat> One of the ways for marketing is to really get adult learners on your selection committee to advise. So if they're involved in some way <clears throat> with helping building the collection, then they can um, will be more likely to check them out or you know recommend them to others. Uh, certainly, making sure that the volunteer tutors are um, uh, have a good uh, feel of what you have. Uh, often in, in tutor training workshops, you, you know, one of the aspects is having a session on on the collection and and trying to figure out ways to make it fun. That's the that's that's the real challenge with it. But there's there's some ways. Other thoughts out there from those of you running programs? Oh, we have another comment from Susan. Speaking, speaking, speaking. Get out in the community and talk with groups, women's clubs, DAR, civic associations, etc. And then a comment from Dawn. Events and program is listed on is advertised on flyers at each location and is listed on website and in newsletter. Other questions, comments, and. Um... Of course, I threw up you know, the technology. I know some of you actually have uh, some technology, and some of you may be using the new literacy apps. I don't know if anybody is out there. Emily says, what are the literacy apps? Greg, you want to say a little bit more about them? 
Uh, are you referring to the um, the X Prize? Yeah, apps? those. I okay. mean, there's others too, but those happen to be the ones I'm more familiar with. Is the X Prize? Okay. Um, yeah, there was a competition um, uh, where um, this was sponsored through the Barbara Bush Foundation and um, and the Dollar General Literacy Foundation, uh, where they gave a multi-million dollar prize to um, develop. Um, literacy apps for specifically for um, adult literacy learners, um, adult, adult basic education, and ESOL, and um, they had quite a few participants, applicants in that process, and they ultimately selected um, uh, two grand prize winners and then two sort of runner-up winners. So there's four apps uh, out there that kind of were selected as the the premium of, uh, of all the ones that were submitted and um, uh, they went through a communities competition where programs were able to kind of sign up and use uh, those apps free of charge for a while I think several of them now have gone to a fee system because uh, that window has closed but they're they're all pretty affordable um, and um, we have links on our website or if you just even Google uh, X Prize literacy apps, you'll, you'll you'll see the results, and they, you know they're all available through um, uh, at least the Android side. Uh, that was the competition, um, but I think several of them also are available on um, on iOS too. And um, the feedback I've heard, you know, has been generally positive about you know the the quality, you know, the idea of certainly being able to use apps in your free time or in class but you know a lot of times it's focused on being able to add to your instruction in your in your free time and um, it's interesting I saw a presentation that said that they're they're most frequently used like 10 p.m. to midnight I guess when people put the kids to bed or what have you and just have some extra time so um, yeah I would definitely uh, take a look at those they can be a great resource for your students and and it could be something that, you know, a friends of the library or the library could add to your collection. Um, it's just another electronic resource. Although the other piece to it, too, is that volunteers and students need to be um, trained in, in uh, you know, how to get into them. And what's cool is, is, you know, you can be in a grocery line looking at your, your phone and people won't know what you're doing. Whereas that you can be building your literacy skills at the same time, so it's really been a nice concept in that way. <clears throat> but folks will need to, again, like with all the technology out there, uh, have some good ways, like uh, for the um, volunteer tutors and students. And you could actually have students and tutors in the same training session, introducing these literacy apps to both at the at the same time. Um, you know, making. <laughs> Is anybody out there using them? They're real new. They, I mean, they in the sense in the sense of actually the grand prize part of it. It was last, like last summer, wasn't it, or fall? Yeah, That's when they made the announcement. Okay. Um, of course, other questions, comments. And and see down at the bottom is that list I just dropped in some things of course there's links that will be popping out into there but you can see English language learners I did hear something that they're right now proposing the citizenship cost of um, taking the citizenship uh, going up it seems to me it was like 83 <clears> percent <throat> we do have a comment um, has anyone hosted citizenship workshops I'm seeing if anybody here, I know folks have uh, done, um, I think a reasonable number of folks. We, uh, this is Eric in Tampa. We've done a, a few of them over the past year in partnership with, um, we had a Hispanic Services Council here in Hillsborough County that we did some and we are now working with an organization through the school system called Carib, and uh, we'll be running those throughout the next year at various libraries. 
if I could just add one thing that's maybe relevant on, on this particular topic is that school districts um, or through the Florida Department of Education, and this is a relatively recent development, um, they have they have an official list of sort of the different kind of courses uh, that programs that are funded through their system um, can get, um, you know, grant dollars uh, to implement. And um, they recently took citizenship classes off that list. Um, so uh, local school districts can still offer citizenship classes, but it's not sort of part of their um, official state reimbursable kinds of classes. So I definitely think there's, there's going to likely be a scaling back of the, the classes that are offered to help uh, prepare for citizenship. And this may be an opportunity where libraries can, uh, can you know, uh, step in if there's a need there. And I think there often is. Um, and I know a number of libraries and, and community-based nonprofits have been doing citizenship for years. But I, I just wanted to let you know that that's a a development that you know might make fewer resources available in terms of that kind of instruction through the school districts moving forward. We have another. Oh, thank you. Um, we have another comment from Susan. Yes, we do in Citrus. We have USCIS come in two times per year for Citizenship 101 sessions. We also hold a tutor training just for NAT slash Citizenship instructors. Instructors. Many of our learners use the USCIS.gov app for naturalization. Okay, other questions, comments, thoughts, things you're maybe planning? Matthew, you can go ahead and talk. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to throw this out to the group, and um, I don't think we would be able to get anything organized in time for the uh, health literacy uh, grant application. I think it's just a couple weeks away. But we did start talking about um, something that I think Miami-Dade is working on, the consumer health, um, uh, I forget what the rest of it is, CHIS, you know, in the, in the certification program and, and the instruction, and then developing our own series, maybe starting in April or May. Um, and just wanted to see, uh, we've done sort of recreational health programs quite a lot over the years, and occasionally more literacy-based things, but not regularly. And so this is kind of a new uh, ground for us to try and do something either monthly or every other month. And just wanted to see if anybody had experience with that um, in delivering consumer health from a literacy perspective, uh, actually using staff rather than and, and librarians rather than uh, community partners. And if there's anything that you, any advice you have. Any thoughts or things that you're doing out there that as Tampa is getting more, a more focused program? And I'll throw in as a sort of an added question. Uh, since we probably won't have it organized in time for the health literacy grant deadline, do we know that that will be offered again next year, possibly? Uh, probably will be, but it's uh, actually it will be next year. Uh, they refunded us um, for the initiative, they meaning the Florida Blue Foundation, for a three year cycle. So I believe this is the second of that three year cycle. And, um, and so we, we will have another opportunity next year, hopefully beyond that. I mean, they've been very generous supporters and have uh, supported the initiative for um, a decade now. We're t it's 10 years old. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, we'd love to have your application this year, but if that's not workable, um, it's webinar. you know, to, you know, it'll be, it won't, it'll be coming along again at some point. And I applaud your efforts to, promote the uh, CHIP program, the Children's Health Insurance Program, because that's an important <laughs> source of insurance for low-income folks. Um, and, uh, and we likewise try to, I mean, the window of opportunity is closed at this point in terms of open enrollment for the um, Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, but that's another opportunity that comes up. Um, and I think libraries can have a real instrumental, and do have an instrumental role in kind of helping 
people to understand um, a little bit about what that's all about and where they can get more information um, because it's a, it's a great source for people to be able to get subsidized health insurance. Okay, thank you. And I, I uh, should have clarified, I, the CHIS acronym, uh, and we love our acronyms in the library world, don't we? Um, I was actually referring to, I just looked it up, it's Consumer Health Information Specialization. That's what I was, oh, okay. I was saying. Oh, okay, CHIS. Okay, I thought you said CHIP. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Like consumer Health. But it's, yeah. good to know, it's good to know about that program as well. Yeah. I'm curious if I can ask a question about whether folks are doing anything around um, census education, um, we're trying to put out some information, uh, some lesson plans and so forth, but the census is just around the corner and um, it's, uh, I don't know if people know um, always why it's important to be able to respond to the census. I know that the, um, I've seen some of the materials through the ALA and others that have um, educational materials around the census, which are excellent. Um, and I'm just wondering, if uh, anybody has any plans to do any promotion around uh, helping students to understand uh, what the census is and why it's important, and you know how to how to go about um, responding and, and completing the the forms. Um, I can chime in just one more time here. Uh, again, this is I should have said last time. This is Matthew with the Orange County Library System. Um, we have the census office, or maybe the local census office. Uh, are, we're coordinating with them, and they're actually going to be coming out to do information sessions at about, I think, half of our locations, so about maybe seven or eight locations uh, in March. And um, and then in addition to that, we have, um, for our Right Services, the Right Time um, project, we have sort of de dedicated terminals at most of our locations for that and are putting um, the link to the, the live census on those machines so that uh, customers who come in don't have to have a library card in order to sit down at a computer and uh, and fill it out. Oh, great. Yeah, it is, a, it is electronic, or, or I guess most people are receiving a, a card um, versus the full form. I know it depends. Uh, they will be sending out some with full forms, but I guess the majority are going to be getting a card, and so you need to go online and if you don't have access to online, the library can be a great opportunity to do that, I guess. We have a comment from Emily. Yes, our library is hosting training for the census through our local office as well. We have a lot of printed materials out for our patrons as well. Okay, very good. I do think with our ESL students, it's really important to communicate what it's all about and that it's uh, under the law, uh, that information is confidential and will not be shared with, um, you know, anybody else, any, you know, other agencies and so forth. We have another comment from Susan. Yes, similar to Matthew, we are reserving certain computers for assistance in completing the census. And then we have a comment from Dawn. Library staff is being trained to assist folks with the online form, email sent to tutors to cover with their students. Okay, great. Any other comments, questions? We've got about another 15 minutes if we go to, to um, noon. Also just interested back with those of you who are relatively new as far as what, you know, what more would you like to know in the context of, you know, starting up with a new job in, in adult literacy, volunteer literacy. While you're thinking about that, I want to share something that we are doing here with the division. And that is uh, we're doing uh, short story book discussion kits. We're doing uh, a, a set for uh, English language learners and then another one more for intergenerational literacy. And so uh, for those of you who actually check out um, 
book discussion kits. This is around short stories and folk tales. And so we'll be doing some more, some training on that. And we'll have sub kits that will be available for those of you who want to take on uh, doing this. What's cool about it, you could, you could use it with a small group, English language learners or a family, you know, family learning. Uh, the other thing you could do is uh, check out the kit to a uh, .ed class. So there's different ways that they, that they could actually be used. We have a comment from Sheila that says, we are working with summer reading to make sure basic literacy and ESOL learners can participate and feel included. And then we have a couple of questions from Daniela. Uh, the first is, anybody have a copy of the census information flyers you share with patrons? And then the second is, do you translate library marketing or have your website content available in multiple languages? Good questions. What's what's happening out there? Any comments? I know some libraries just setting aside the census thing, but the um, actually hire a, I'll say telephone company kind of thing who can do some translations just on the fly. That's more like for reference or those kind of questions, but uh, go ahead. We have a comment from Sheila that says, we have a way to translate website in multiple languages, Drupal based. We have some materials in Spanish. Then we have a comment from Matthew that says, we provide a, lots of marketing in Spanish and some in Haitian Creole, depending on the area, uh, translation provided by library staff. And then we have a comment from Melissa, some library marketing is translated in Hill Hillborough County, including Read With Me books advertisements. Website translated at bottom of our page for the library. And then we have a comment from Susan regarding new literacy staff is new tutor training or other training GED citizenship, etc. A challenge collection development assessment slash capturing gains getting funding public speaking. I'm curious as to what new literacy staff needs as well. And then we have another comment from Daniela. We are in process of translating all of our rack cards into our top three languages. So uh, yeah, I'm just curious back to what pe people are. Um, I was wondering about the three languages. I see Spanish, Russian, and Vietnamese. <laughs> um, but as far as what folks might need to know and what they need to know sooner than later, you know, there's sort of obviously when you take over a new job, a new area of expertise, <clears throat> there's some aspects of it you need to learn real fast, and there's others that you know you sort of build up to. I know um, that for some folks, if you come in from outside into the library world, there are some specific things that are uh, to working in a library volunteer literacy program or a library literacy program that are different from working in a 100% community-based program. And in some areas, it's actually purchasing books, you know, the structure that the library has. <laughs> And I know some libraries don't like um, workbooks. Um, and if they buy those, they actually keep them to loan out to the tutor pairs rather than putting them into the collection. Uh, I know I read an article in the Library Journal years and years ago that what do you do if somebody puts in the answers? Well, the, the author of that article actually said, well, if they're correct, it's okay. <laughs> If they're incorrect, then it's a problem. Okay. 
Another thing I'd like to know is how you how you inform other staff, like in branches and across the, the county or the city, in uh, promoting the literacy program. We have a comment from Melissa. The intersection of literacy work with our council and our affiliation with the library has our staff of two navigating both worlds. So I'm happy to be here and learning what is available. Yeah, absolutely, because it is it is a nonprofit world is different from the library governance world. And yet you're you're working closely together. Melissa says we sent holiday cards to our branches and we'll have a presentation on our internal website called LibNet. We conduct trainings at branches too, both for tutors and staff. Excellent. That holiday cards, that's a great idea. Yeah, it's nice to have great ideas that are simple to do. <laughs> One area that libraries are, in my experience, are often different too is um, sort of looking at the what kind of data they collect um, around measures of success and so forth. Um, some, you know, some programs have, you know, especially if they're being funded through the Florida Department of Education, you know, very specific assessment tools that have to be used. A lot of the community-based nonprofits don't necessarily use those, but they may collect information other than what the library may collect. Um, you know, uh, sometimes libraries look at, you know, how many people got library cards and their uh, usage of library services and things of that nature. And, but one of the better, I think, assessment um, systems is through the California. And California has a very robust library-based literacy system. And they have something that they developed, which we've recommended a number of times, called Roles and Goals. And you might want to just Google Florida, I mean, uh, California Libraries Roles and Goals. And they have a system around student goal setting and sort of measuring those goals, uh, which has really worked well for them. Yeah, that, that is a really good site. They've got a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah. There's a lot out there, just in general. It, it's There's so much out there. To me, it's a little overwhelming, given you know, the fact of um, doing literacy in this internet-savvy world. Sandy, I know you mentioned the, the webinar. Yeah. that we have coming up next well, month, um, but should we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, or? yeah, go ahead and jump in, and I'm going to scroll it down so we've got the date a little bit more. Okay. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> there, okay, you're good, right there. The February 10th. So this is, yeah, the 10th. Um, and folks on this call may be interested in attending. It, it really, the target audience primarily is our libraries, um, library managers, and so forth, who are not engaging in what you all are engaging in. They're not doing necessarily doing adult literacy programming. Uh, they may have some special collections and so forth, but um, if they're interested in, in um, getting involved and in, 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 um, filling a gap perhaps in their communities, there's, um, we identified about a dozen, um, most, I think they were all rural uh, counties that don't have either a library or a, a community-based nonprofit literacy provider. Uh, so this session really is kind of looking at the pros and cons of establishing a program and what value that brings to the community, um, how that's tied to library services, and um, what the overall mission of your library is and so forth. So, um, so FLC is facilitating this in terms of just, you know, running the, uh, the, the uh, webinar, but um, Sandy and Susan are both going to be presenters. We also have uh, Katrina Evans from Columbia County Library, who's the library director there. And um, if any of you are interested in participating and in, in maybe saying a few words, I don't know, Sandy, if that would be workable or not um, from your perspective, but we'd love to hear success stories um, uh, from, um, from programs that are doing this and doing it well uh, so that uh, 
uh, other library systems may you know give some serious consideration to start a program of their own absolutely yeah again the more interactive that that we can have that and hearing from folks <coughs> and their successes would be excellent and um, just as a heads up the another alphabet soup library service and technology act is our federal grant funding uh, that is funneled through the division here with the state library uh, the deadline for this year is March 16th. Uh, applicants uh, need to apply uh, uh, if they're a standalone library they can have a master's librarian they can apply uh, directly if they're in a, if you happen to have, be a library system that's in a cooperative the cooperative itself uh, um, has to apply the single administrative head on behalf of can be on behalf of a specific program like volunteer literacy or specific needs in a in a community but it, that is uh, the way that works and one of the uh, services that we offer those who are uh, applying for an LSTA grant is to um, read drafts and uh, so we'd love to have some of you if you're interested in, in uh, applying for a grant you know it'd be great if you want to call and just talk with with me I'm I'm good sort of at a, at a front-end idea development you know what is it you know, does this look like it's a, a good idea and something that would work and have you done enough needs assessment or do you need to do more needs assessment uh, with that and then we also have people who are really good detail people who read the drafts and and uh, you know pinpoint what's ambiguous that's not clear and uh, so we do provide that service with uh, anybody who wants to apply for an LSTA grant so that deadlines March 16th this year usually it's around the middle of March so and I, I mentioned earlier I believe library day is uh, uh, January 22nd uh, Florida Library Association uh, hosts that and you know, a lot of our particularly smaller counties get um, state aid all many counties get state aid and then our smaller counties get larger sums of state aid but it has to be appropriated by the legislature and it's a totally different kind of grant program you know that's different from this LSTA that I've been talking about any questions comments we're down to three more minutes two minutes I should say <laughs> and anything you uh, there will be an evaluation that goes out for this anything that um, suggestions or how we can improve the dynamics of, of this please let us know hope to see some of you at the Florida Literacy Conference I plan to be there we'll have some programs as you heard earlier Diana says, you too, I hope to go as well. Sounds good. Yeah, we'd love to see you there. Hope you can join us. Well, we're pretty much officially over. Thank you <coughs> for um, participating in this discussion and uh, looking forward to working with all of you on your literacy programs, adult literacy, and all variations thereof. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Greg. Okay. And Susan and everybody else who has contributed. Good questions, good interaction.